game room and here is part two of three of the console wars in the last video we discussed how atari and mattel electronics duked it out only to and hero themselves in grand fashion in the game in crash of 83 um now we are in part two and we are going to discuss the dynamic war between Sega and Nintendo. Nintendo was the king of the world in 1985. They released the NES, which pretty much jump started the which pretty much jump started the dead battery that was the American games industry, even though arcades continued to flourish, and if you home to owned a home computer, then nothing changed. But nonetheless, <clears throat> Nintendo pretty much revived the console industry there and owned most of the mar market share, mostly due to advertising, mostly due to the, I would say, mafioso way that Nintendo handled things. In fact, Nintendo back in the 80s was the mafia man of the games industry. They forced developers into, stu into stuffy, stiff contracts that forced them to release three games per year but only for their system, to buy everything from dev kits to blank cartridges from Nintendo, and Nintendo even did the worst possible thing and under-delivered games and systems to retailers. Thus, there is a always a sort of fake, artificial, manufactured scarcity of Nintendo shit. The reason why was Nintendo was always under-delivering. In fact, you can learn all these things by reading the book Console Wars. It's a book about Sega and Atari. It's over there somewhere. I forgot who wrote it. Anyway, so Nintendo was owning everything. Sega wasn't so good. In fact, they had a horrible start at the Master System because they thought, oh, let's give the American rights to Tonka. You know, if they're good selling, if they're so good selling little yellow trucks, maybe they would be really good at selling video game systems. They weren't. Simply put, they weren't. And so uh, Sega set up offices in America, took that away from them, but by then the damage was done. And so Sega was like, all right, fine, let's make a 16-bit console. And so they took an arcade machine, shaved off a bunch of its bits, and then turn it into the Mega Drive, which later got ported to the Americas as the Genesis. I have one right over here. And then Sega would was, you know, we're like, all right, what can we do to kick Nintendo in the ass? And so Michael Katz, president of Sega of America, was like, let's do a tar Sega does when Nintendo don't which was a catchy sort of jingle with like flashy in-your-face advertising involving Sega games, even though it was really iconic and really famous, it really didn't do Sega a lot of good. In fact, according to the book uh, Console Wars, it didn't do too hot. And so Michael Katz got replaced by Tom Kalinske, who decided on several different things. One, to cut the price of the Genesis. Secondly, to package Sonic the Hedgehog, which by then was sort of released as a replacement for Alex Kidd, and because Sega really needed a mascot platformer that would kick Mario in the ass. Which it did, but we'll get into that later. And another thing was aggressive marketing. Now, Sega of Japan hated this. In fact, Hayao Nakayama, in one of the few good things in his horrid life, gave Tom Klinsky free reign to do things. Even though his free reign, him letting him do things free reign, would only last a few years. Which we'll get into later. So, Sega of America, and Sega of America was only doing this, Sega of Japan wanted to do their own thing because, why not? And did a lot of aggressive advertising. And it was mostly saying, look at how fast our games are. Look at how much action is our games. They even made an advert comparing Sonic the Hedgehog, I think it was Sonic the Hedgehog 2, to Mario Kart being a fast Ferrari and 
Super Mario Kart only being sort of a old milk truck, milk delivery truck. You can't make this shit up. Sega went balls deep into this, and Nintendo was like, Ugh. at first Nintendo dismissed Sega as just a bunch of upstarts that were just gonna kill themselves in the end because Nintendo knew that the good times always never end, except Sega was changing the scope of things. For one, Sega decided to appeal to an older audience. They wanted to be hip. They wanted to be cool. They wanted to be in with the Nickelodeon watching, MTV watching generation of nitwits. They want to be, they want to be like this in, be in with this in crowd who are all teenagers and adolescents. You know, young adults, people between the ages of 18 to 22, or 25, depending on how you put things into perspective. So anywhere between 15 to 16 to 25, you were in the Sega zone. And, you know, when your hip older brother is, doing, is playing Sega, you want to be just like him. You always wanted to be like the cool kid, the popular kid. You always wanted to be like him, so you bought a Sega. And Nintendo was slowly but surely losing market share to Sega. And they're like, what the fuck? And it's because of Image. Now, if you've watched any of the Right Opinions videos, you'll notice that a lot of people care about their image. Some to the extent where it actually harms their relationships with other human beings. Particularly their audience, but if that is neither here or there. What is here or there is Sega's use of Image. They portrayed themselves as the hippest, the coolest, the one with the fastest system. They had blast processing, which basically meant that their mic that their CPU, a Motorola 68000, ran almost more than around four to five megahertz faster than this than the CPU of a Super Nintendo. Like this one. This one actually had the same CPU as an Apple II GS, which is strange, but you know, Sega does what Nintendo apparently. So then Nintendo was like, all right, we need to really kick things into high gear. And they started the Play It Loud marketing campaign, which tried to rebrand Nintendo as less of this family friendly, Disney sort of image into a cool, hip, sort of MTV thing. Sega. So right now we are heading into the mid-90s, and Sega does a lot of things. They release sports games, which, you know, bolstered the image of Sega, portraying to, you know, the male al active adolescent. They release, you know arcade games, which, you know, with Sega's faster CPU, allowed itself to handle shoot-em-ups. Like, for instance, you can definitely, without a doubt, port Toho Project 6, Embodiment of a Scarlet Devil, to a Sega Genesis without making any sort of compromise. A Super Nintendo... You bet your ass that Raimu Hakurai is going to move so slow and that the Danmaku is going to be so reduced, it wouldn't become a bullet hell anymore. It would just become purg bullet purgatory. Because Sega does when Nintendo don't, and that's being able to handle Toho's ratchety ass. Anyway, so Sega decides, well, let's be on the cutting edge and release add-ons for our system. And by the way, I don't have any problems against add-ons, all right? Add-ons are a great way of expanding your system's capabilities without, you know, without, you know, making a new system. Like, for instance, the Mattel voice synthesis module. Half the shit that you plug into a ColecoVision, like a steering wheel, or that little thing that lets you play 2600 games on a ColecoVision. I am not against the idea of it, so long it's reasonably priced and so long it upgrades 
the system's capability to an acceptable degree, then it's okay my buck. Except they didn't. They released the Sega CD, which was at the cutting edge. It used the new compact disc format, which actually isn't new at all because it finished development in the early 80s, grew in popularity through the 80s, and by now was being refined enough to be used in video game consoles. Of course, Sega wasn't the first to use CDs, the Turbo Graphics was, but that's neither here or there. Anyway, it was overpriced, prone to mechanical failure, and had no good games that took advantage of the hardware. Like, for example, your choices for C Sega CD titles were games that made use of the system, like, and by the way, there's only like two I can think of, uh, Lunar the Silver Star and Sonic CD. Or you could get Genesis ports that only add a CD soundtrack, like Earthworm Jim or, you know, friggin' Sonic. Not Sonic, but uh, there was a bunch of re-released Sonic uh, Sega games on the CD. Um, you could get, or you could get shitty FMV games, like Sewer Shark. I used to own Sear Shark until it disappeared several years ago. And it was a turd of a game. I have no idea how to play it. And then you have Night Trap, which, you know, is alright. If you like Five Nights at Freddy's and you're severely entertained with a bunch of fake-ass animatronics created by a Christian dude, then you're gonna love Night Trap. Oh boy, if you love the Five Nights at Freddy's franchises, oh boy, wait until you pop in Night Trap. Strap yourselves in, boys, because, oh boy, it's going to be a wild ride what Night Trap is going to be for you, for you FNAF fans. And yes, I am being sarcastic. Um, so, Sega decided, oh, let's shoot ourselves in the foot. <laughs> As Donald Trump would go, Bing, bing, bing. So they go bing, bing, bing in their foot a couple of times. And then and Sega is like, well, that's fine. So long we don't do it again. And they did it again with the 32X. And so, by the way, the 32X was kind of a weird story. At first, Tom Klinsky was against it. He said, bruh, this is gonna, this is going to make our market share tank because it's going to split up whatever systems we that we have to support. <coughs> I can barely get developers to make shit for it as it is. But then Hayao Nakayama, being a asshole that he is, decides to push it onto him and release it anyway, which didn't do so well. In fact, the 32X was meant to be a sort of low budget sort of alternative to getting a Saturn. You can get the hot new Saturn for $4.99, or just for like 200 bucks, you can get a 32X that you plug into your Genesis, which in theory was great. But the thing was, Sega wasn't a computer manufacturer, where by the way, that's okay. Or if you're in the automobile industry, which that is okay too. Both the computer industry and the automobile industry love making less powerful slash more powerful and medium powered versions of the same bloody product. Anyway, but video game systems, you need one product, two if you're going handheld. That's it. And Sega pretty much split their resources and shot themselves in the foot. Bing, 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 bing. And then, so, and then Nintendo was like, Guess what? Two games. They needed two games to kick Sega in the ass. Star Fox and Donkey Kong Country. Star Fox used the Super FX chip, which allowed the Super Nintendo to have rudimentary 3D graphics, some of which can be texture mapped with little sprites, but that's eh. But when it was released, Star Fox was the most amazing game ever. 3D on a 16-bit console that only had a 3 point, you know, 5 something speed, clock speed, 
CPU. That is friggin' amazing. And then they decided, oh, guess what? For Donkey Kong Country, you don't need a Super FX chip, which, by the way, are built into the cartridges. So that's neither here or there. And si S Nintendo was like, oh, with Donkey Kong Country, you, you got wonderful pre-rendered 3D sprites. And you don't need a Super F... We don't have to put a Super FX chip in it. And thus, Nintendo was innovating by pushing their games forward. And they had to because the Nintendo 64, this sucker, wouldn't come out until 1996. So they need to extend the Super Nintendo's lifespan by releasing these sort of games. And so they did. At Sega's expense. Sega, going into 1995, was a rough year for them. Heo Nakayama was sort of pulling the rug from underneath Tom Kalinske. Tom Kalinske had his hand tines behind his back. And at a fateful dinner, Heo Nakayama said, release the Saturn or else. And Tom Kalinske was like, make me. And he said, okay, I will. Do it. He was like, fine. In fact, the Saturn wasn't supposed to be released until September 1995 on a day called Saturn Day. As you can tell, it was going to be released on a Saturday. Nope, they released it on E3 for $99. Of course, around this time, newcomer Sony decided to make their speech the shortest speech on Earth. A speech so short and so concise, it's almost like you took the Gettysburg Address and whatever the hell George Patton was doing, and you pushed it together in one glorious, short-ass speech. The speech went like this. <clears throat> 299. That was it. A number. Three digits and a dollar sign. 299. Sony just played Sega. Of course, Nintendo was playing themselves because, one, they decided to stick for cartridges for their next system, and they decided that, you know, alienating their dev third party developers was a good idea. After all, they already done that for the Super Nintendo and NES. Whoop-de-doo. So, you know. Thus, the console war ended. And how did it end? Well, it started out with Nintendo winning. And then Sega came in, and they started winning. Winning a lot. But in the end, Nintendo, through Sega fucking up, and through Nintendo flipping the script, Nintendo won. And yes, this is a technically a win for Nintendo, considering that... Nintendo sold more Super Nintendos, considering that the Super Nintendo was supported a year longer than the Genesis, even though they both shared the same final release, Frogger. And, yeah, Nintendo won. However, I do have a soft spot for Sega. In fact, Sega was one of my favorite console manufacturers, mostly because, and by the way, I'm going to mention this in a talk about this at length in another video but I just love the culture and just the impact on culture and what the Sega Genesis stands for for 90s pop culture anyway this is the end of the video like and subscribe or else I will unleash Hayao Nakayama onto you who will force you to like and subscribe until you pass out I don't know what he's gonna do but he's going to make you pass out. Maybe he'll push his nose three times and say, bip, bip, bip. Who knows? He is a crazy man. So crazy that he shot Sega in the foot. Bing, bing, bing. Thank you. And goodbye.